Hey, Dr. Tran, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm good. What's up? Just had a quick question that doesn't have to be related to engineering. I just sure. have a problem that I, I'm dealing with. How do you yeah. deal with overthinking? I feel like I just can't stop thinking and thinking and thinking. Do you ever yeah. get that? Yeah, no, yeah, it's, 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 it's a problem. Um, I, I, I've definitely, you know, experienced that too. And a lot of my friends do that too. You know, mm -hmm. I think, I think just with, with a lot of experience, I think, you know, like the way I kind of think of it is like when I'm like really thinking hard about a problem um, and, you know, I'm thinking, you know, like, like, like for me, you know, I think a lot about, you know, is this kind of the best way to approach this, this thing? Is this kind of the best way to go about this? Or is, was that kind of the best way for me to interact with that person or whatever? Um, and, you know, Usually, usually a lot of times this is, this is kind of after the fact, but after something kind of happened um, and I kind of think about it and I, you know, and I, I try to overthink it. And I think, you know, if I did this differently, you know, how much would, how much would the outcome really change? And some, sometimes it does, but a lot of times I find that, you know, when I, when I compare, you know, kind of the decision that I make in the moment compared to what I think, what I end up deciding when I overthink it, the outcome is not really all that different. And so, a lot of times, you know, I, I tell myself that, you know, you, you think and you think, you think a lot, a, 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 a lot of the time, but then a lot of times, you know, sometimes like the, the initial thing that you, that you thought and kind of your initial kind of gut reaction, that's, that's already going to get you, you know, um, already mm -hmm. pretty close. And like the more that you think about it, it's just, it's just kind of, you know, um, not, I don't want to say wasted time because I think there's a lot of value for like, you know, learning about a situation and kind of think of it that way. But I don't want to, but like, I don't agonize over like, oh, I should have done this differently or oh, I, I could have done that differently, you know, because it's ultimately, it's, it's, it's not going to change all that much. And even if it does, like there's, you know, there's a lot of situations where I've found that, you know, even if I did make a wrong decision or wrong, you know, wrong choice and like, mm -hmm. I, and like, I tell myself, you know, maybe if I thought more, I could change it. But even in those situations, I can look back and say, okay, you know, afterwards, like I was able to fix it um, anyway. Um, and just that in general, that there's, there's, there's just so many things that kind of call my attention anyway, that if I spend too much time thinking about one thing, that's, that kind of pulls me away from like a lot of other aspects of my life. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Just, I feel like, yeah, there's definitely just no right or wrong decision. It's just, we just have to decide and just decide and decide. And yeah. I mean, I mean, learn. right. I mean, my don't, don't give, don't like, um, <laughs> you know, don't, don't just give it your gut reaction to everything. I mean, give it things. <laughs> A, good, a decent amount of thought but you know yeah. i think you know um after a certain point you think you know if i think about this anymore it's it's, it's only just stressing me out and it's not mm -hmm. it's not it's not doing anything productive you know i think if you kind of, kind of constantly ask yourself that question then i think that's that's what kind of stops you from overthinking this like, right, i'm not going to think about this anymore because it's, it's not going to do anything helpful for me awesome really appreciate your advice thank you <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. i see you have uh collaborations hidden from the rest of us so are you only collaborating with yourself what are you what are you talking about <laughs> uh on the uh the, the titanium page on the left hand side bar collaborations is hidden oh <laughs> are, you having, the, are you are you having conferences and collaborations with i don't yourself? even know i i don't i don't even know what half of this stuff even does like they they made a switch to canvas which i, I like canvas I, I like it but then they give us all oh, these sorry, things canvas, and, yeah. And like, I don't even know like what these do. Actually, let's click this and find out what it does. Oh God. <laughs> do you, do your other classes have this? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I think you have the most tabs out of. Okay, that, that's because I'm in a, I'm in instructor view. And so instructor view, even though I tell it to hide these things, it still shows it to me for whatever reason, so. Um, yeah, no, I think uh, my other class, uh, Professor, uh, for my my professor for uh, 438 he yeah. has like just home grades wow. and assignments that's it okay. he doesn't even have an announcement page <laughs> so the, uh, the, bare, the bare essentials <laughs> no, the, the, literally the, the absolute i think he would fit everything into the home tab if he really could but, i see i see yeah
Well, I mean, that's that's not too different from how Titanium was. Titanium was just one big just home page, and then you just added everything to that home page. So. Yeah. Hey, Professor, I just got a weird question to ask you about the ANSYS thing. I don't know if it's just my ANSYS in general. Whenever I apply a fine mesh to my crank, um, it immediately forces it to tetrahedrons. Mm -hmm. um, I have it on hex, um, only hex two, um, and I have it set at 0 0.1 inches, mm -hmm. um, which is fine. I get a really nice fine mesh for like over the entire thing in inches. But then as soon as I try to apply a, fi apply a finer mesh, to the holes, um, it just immediately forces everything to tetrahedrons. And I thought maybe it's because it's since it's getting so small, it just has to do triangles or tetrahedrons. Uh, so then I tried increasing the normal mesh, like the, the for the entire thing, to like 0.25 and 0.5, and then applying the the um, the refinement to the holes again. And it still will not. As soon as I apply the refinement, no matter how much I like jank with it, um, it just always forces it to tetrahedrons so yeah yeah the the, the measure measuring meshing is always kind of an interesting thing i mean the, the tetrahedrons is kind of the good um kind of fallback and so um you know tetrahedrons will work in in any in any situation and so yeah it, and like i i can't claim to understand ansys's measure all that that much um i haven't played around with it enough to really know um but i'm guessing what's happening is that as you refine the mesh then there's probably one area where it's it's really struggling to put a hex in there. Um, yeah. Because hexahedrons, hexahedrons are, are hexahedrons are really nice when they work, but they just uh, but just the way that meshing algorithms work is just it's hard to squeeze them in, in certain areas. Yeah. What I'm assuming is is just how awkward the um, the crank is. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's not because right. like with our plate, at least it's a square, but it has a hole in it. Right. So at least mm -hmm. um, Ansys knew where to start, like in the bottom corners or whatever to like right. start the hexes. Right. But yeah, no, it's, uh, I'm assuming it's a mixture between the crank not being even remotely like square shaped because it's just mm -hmm. literally like two thick uh, circular areas with a tiny neck and then right. holes. Right. So mm -hmm. I think it's just anything smaller than 0.1 and then with refinement, um, just it just can't seem to like find out where to start the hexes. It just because it's just so awkward, I think, for it to do. Yeah, so, no, I I agree with that. Yeah, that geometry was definitely very curved and very strange. Yeah, well, it's I just think it doesn't you... agree. It doesn't like curved geometry like at all. Right. When, right. when it comes to hexes. Yeah. You, usually though, um, usually the the trend that you see is that when you refine the mesh more, it should help it to squeeze more hexes in there because you know a smaller hex. You know, three smaller hexes are easier to fit than one bigger one. But yeah, well, that was the weirdest weird thing about things. mine is as soon as I did the refinement, like the in, not not just like um, not just like um, around the 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 holes, but like the entire thing immediately went to tetrahedrons. It mm -hmm. didn't even try to put hexes in it, which is a yeah, weird. yeah. It's yeah. I I'm I'm not sure. Typically, how meshing softwares work is that they start by populating um, the geometry with points. And so um, usually what they'll do is that they'll, they'll take your geometry, they'll take its bounds basically and, and seed it with a bunch of points and then try to connect them into, uh, into all the, the shapes that you, um, that you specify. Um, so it could just be with the refinement, there's like one area where the points got fit in and that it's impossible for them to connect them into a hex. And then, you know, it just kind of transforms the whole thing into, into test. Got it. Well, I mean, just for mine, I just included the, um... 0.1 inch with hexes without mm -hmm. the refinement and then i just did the tetrahedrons with refinement okay that's okay because i because yeah, i yeah. couldn't get i i couldn't do like just one without getting the other so i just included right. both yeah it's fine i mean for you know in terms of the results it, it doesn't usually it usually doesn't affect it i mean tets tets are so good now that you know it's you can you can get accurate more like more or less the same accuracy with either one and so you know in, in terms of accuracy it doesn't really matter it just it makes some um, you know, minor, um, you know, adjustments to the cost, but, you know, those usually are, are, are fairly minor. So, you know, if it doesn't work with hexes, then I would say definitely just go with tets and it's, it's, it's not that big a deal. Okay. It's uh, four o'clock. So let's go ahead and get started today. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone, how's everyone doing today? Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, I know you guys must have had a busy weekend for, for this class. I know we had a mod due recently. So we had the homework to do Friday. Uh, we had the homework, our ANSYS activity to do today. Uh, and then we have the midterm coming up this week as well. So I know it was, it was a really busy week, um, you know, 
uh, for uh, for this class. So I just want to take a minute just to say, you know, I appreciate you know all the work you guys are putting in for this class. You know, I know it's a, I know it's kind of a lot, but you know, what I'm hoping is that um, you know a lot of these things, especially with these ANSYS activities, they get you uh, you know they get you more familiar with the software and more confidence to start using it on other stuff. <laughs> Days are just blending together. Uh, yeah, especially with the uh, daylight savings now, everything is kind of uh, wonky with, uh, with that. Um, all right. And so with that, uh, and with, so with that said, you know, we're um, today is our next ANSYS activity. And so we're doing ANSYS activity three today. And so we're going to be using um, ANSYS. And so uh, if you want to follow along, you can, you can boot up ANSYS Workbench and you can go to the uh, Canvas site. And what I'm showing you here is the assignment page. And so you can download the PDF for the assignment here, and then the CAD file for this um, uh, for this activities can be downloaded here as well. Okay, and so we're going to do the exact same kind of uh, method that we did last time. And so we're going to uh, basically boot up Workbench, imp uh, import this geometry, and then start working with that. Okay? And then the due date for this assignment is going to be next Friday, right? And so that's the Friday uh, right before spring break. And so I, I did this so that. Um, you know, uh, we'll have a due date right before spring break, and then I won't I won't assign anything over the spring break. Uh, so that'll be that'll be your guys's break for for the class. Okay, um, but I but you know uh, I'll be grading. Of course, I'll be grading your stuff over the uh, the spring break, um, but you won't have to worry about anything for that. Okay, all right. Um, and so um, you know, if you guys are booting up Workbench, I'll give you guys a second to do that. Um, and while people are doing that, are there any questions that I can answer um, right now about the exam or about you know the activity or, or anything? I have a question. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the side post geometry that you have, it's A G. Oh, it's ANSYS. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Is there ever like any issues with a certain program trying to transfer it into ANSYS in your experience yeah i mean there um for if the geometry was created in in like a fairly standard software like solidworks usually there's there's not an issue um but um sometimes you know like if if the assembly has you know a lot of a lot of parts in it that that can cause some some issues too but nothing too major i would say as, as long as the files are in the right format um and so this this geometry was obviously created in ansys because it's you know agtb file but if you're for a SOLIDWORKS geometry, if you're importing like a step file or an IGS, I haven't really seen any any issues, especially for the final project. You know what a lot of people like to do um, is they um, they like to grab they get they like to get their CAD CAD file from online, and so a popular site for that is going to be GrabCAD. And so I haven't heard about any issues with people with using GrabCAD before, um, but you know I won't I won't say that there there aren't issues, <laughs> but uh, but usually but usually usually not. It's not. And then I have one more question. Will we be doing anything in regards to like um, like an analysis with like heat transfer or anything like that? Yeah, so that'll be that'll be closer to the end of the class. So so right now we're kind of still um, we're kind of still learning more kind of the basics of ANSYS. And so I'm, I'm sticking to just structural simulations. Uh, but at the end of the class, I have some optional workshops on heat transfer and fluid mechanics as well. Uh, cool. But that'll be more towards more towards the end. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I do want to um, briefly mention too that I'll have the specs for your final project ready by next week. And so we'll probably talk about those on Tuesday. Um, and then, but, but just to kind of give you just a small preview, your, your final project, what is going to be is kind of like a, a free form um, project in ANSYS. And so I'm going to let you guys choose your geometry. I'm going to let you guys choose your analysis. Um, and you're basically just going to perform just an ANSYS um, simulation on that from start to finish. And so you're going to apply all the meshing, all the boundary conditions, analyze the results, um, and then write it up into a report. Right? And so what people typically do is that, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of seniors in this class. So um, a lot of people would use their senior design project for their uh, final answers project. Um, and if you have multiple people in your senior design group in the class too, that works well, then you guys can all work in the same group. Um, it is uh, it is designed to be an individual project, but you know for those students who you know are, you're just naturally working together on the same either senior design or you're working on you know formula or you know um, Titan Arrow, you know I've had those students kind of work together in groups before too, and so you know you can um, I'm okay with with you know you guys working together in groups, but if you work together in groups, you know I'm going to expect a little bit more from your final project. But uh, but your final project, you know I, I really wanted you guys to uh, or I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to choose. 
you know, a problem or a, a situation where you want to analyze with finite elements and then give you the opportunity to do that for your, your final project. Okay? And, you know, a lot of people even take their, you know, final project from this class and make it part of their senior design, uh, especially, especially last year, you know, and probably this year too, because of the pandemic, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of groups didn't end up have, getting to construct or, you know, test out their, um, test out their senior design. Um, or even, you know, test out their, you know, student projects too. And so they use the finite element simulations to kind of um, be in place of that. It's not the perfect, you know, it's not the perfect thing, you know, a finite element simulation is never going to replace reality, but, you know, it was at least something better than just talking about equations in, in CAD, right? Okay. Uh, and so hopefully by now everyone's been able to start up ANSYS. <clears throat> and let's go ahead and get started. Actually, let me show the activity just so you can kind of get an idea of what we're going to do. Okay. And so in this activity, we're going to be simulating a, a signpost. Okay. And so kind of the um, kind of the situation that you can think of in your mind is um, kind of like a, a freeway signpost. So you know, maybe you're driving on the 57, 91 freeway, and you see a signpost here that says, you know, your exit's coming up in half a mile and you're all the way in the carpool lane and you have to um, you know change lanes really quickly, right? And so we're gonna be analyzing one of those things. And in particular, we want to see if you know this design right here is strong enough to um, support all of the, the loading, okay? And so um, there's gonna be a couple of things that are new in this activity that we haven't seen before. Um, first thing that's new is we're gonna be working with an assembly. And so we, we have two different parts here. And so we have one part, which is the actual sign and the other part, which is the, the post, okay? And so we're gonna assign different properties to these guys, um, you know, and that's going to um, you know, affect its, its deformation, okay? Um, and the other thing that we're going to um, do here is that our loading is a lot more complex than what we're used to. And so we have four forces here that we're going to need to take into account. And so we need to take into account the weights of each of the two different um, uh, pieces. Um, and we're also going to need to take into account forces from the wind as well. And so we have a wind force that's going to be pushing on the sign, you know, um, in the direction of the page, which you can see with FY1 here. And we also have a spatially varying wind force, which we're going to put on the side right here. Okay. And so we're going to learn how to do a, a spatially varying uh, distributed force, uh, very similar to what you guys have been, what, um, uh, you know, what we did, what we've done uh, for our beam equations. Okay. All right. And so here's all the dimensions for the for the signs, but you know, all of this is already built into the CAD program and or into the CAD file, and so you don't have to worry about this. Okay. Um, and here's some information about the loading that we're going to apply later. Okay. All right. But the first thing that we have to do, um, besides importing the geometry, is we have to um, define a, a custom material. Okay, and so we're going to do basically the exact same thing that we did last time. Is we're going to create a, uh, a custom material called aluminum sixty sixty one T six. Okay, and that's going to have a Young's modulus of one e to the seven uh, psi, and then a Poisson's ratio of zero point three three. Okay, all right, and so let's go ahead and open up ANSYS, and then. Um, Hopefully, hopefully all the issues with the uh, with the student version and all the you know licenses expiring. Hopefully, all that stuff is is uh, taken care of by now. Uh, but of course, you know if you're having issues with anything, definitely you know uh, let me know. Okay. Um, but you know when you open up Workbench, you end up on this screen right here. And then just like we've always done, we're going to take our static structural simulation and then drag that over into the into this workspace. And then what that's going to do is it's going to create a new static structural analysis, which you see right here. Okay. And we're going to be working in, in here. Right? All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, import our geometry. And so go ahead and highlight the geometry um, row here and then right click it and then click import geometry. Okay. All right. And so you see, I, I, was, te I was testing this earlier. And so the solid signpost geometry is coming from my quick select. Um, but you know, probably for you guys, you don't have this yet. And so you're going to click uh, browse from import geometry, and then you're going to browse over to the file, uh, you know, for the solid signpost. And so this is the, the CAD file that you downloaded from the canvas site right here. So the .agdb file. Okay. All right. So go ahead and load that geometry. So you can just go ahead and click it and click open. Okay. And then just like before, you're going to have a check mark next to the geometry to tell you that the, the CAD file has successfully been, been loaded. All right, was everyone able to open up ANSYS and load the uh, uh, the signpost geometry? Um, I loaded it up, but mine doesn't isn't coming up with uh, all the analysis, the toolbox. Yeah, mine too. Oh, okay. So that's uh, so that issue. Um, so this this was kind of the same thing that happened with the last activity, right? So there was you guys don't see anything over here. 
Oh, wait, I got it. Oh, you got okay. it? Okay. Yeah, if I'm you go to view, and then my toolbox wasn't clicked. So then I clicked toolbox, and then it popped up. Okay, great, great. And so uh, and so, if you're not seeing the toolbox, so go ahead and click view up here, and then make sure that toolbox is selected um, for for that. Yeah. So is, that, is, anyone, is anyone else still uh, not being able to see the toolbox with all the analysis systems here? I think Kirk, I think Kirk, you mentioned um, that you didn't have it either, right? I don't know. My answer is being dumb right now, so just continue on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If it, if it's uh, if it's still not, um, go ahead and try. Um, I I think hopefully uh, reinstalling Ansys and downloading from the um, uh, from the site might help again too. Um, I think because I think before for Ansys Activity One, uh, people were having issues with the license expiring, and so hopefully that's not hopefully um, or that might be what you're what you're experiencing. So if you download the software fresh. It should come with a refreshed license that'll be good until 2022, I believe. I think that's that's what people were mentioning last time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so uh, now that we have the geometry loaded, let's go ahead and add our custom um, our custom material, right? And so this is the same thing that we did for Ansys Activity Two. And so um, in order to do that, we're going to double click Engineering Data from the uh, um, from the workspace. Okay. And that's going to open up this new tab uh, where we can specify new material properties. Something in the chat. All right, question. So how can we save uh, material properties so that uh, we don't have to load it up every single time? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, a question that I, I'm actually not sure. I, I think you can, uh, it looks like you can save it right here. I've actually never done it before, but um, I think if you if you add the material here, and I think if you, this looks like a separate save bar. Oh, that's for project. Let's see. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to look it up, and I'll have to, uh, um, I'll have to kind of get back to you on that. Um, but I think it's, I think there's, there's, there's something that you can save here. We can kind of save a material data sheet for for Ansys, um, and then you can kind of load that in um, each time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've also heard that, and I, I haven't tried this either, but last year people were telling me that you can also import materials from SOLIDWORKS too. So I know SOLIDWORKS has a lot of much bigger uh, material library than ANSYS. And so I think you can import those from SOLIDWORKS and have ANSYS kind of read those material properties as well. I think that's probably the standard way I think people typically use this because the uh, um, SOLIDWORKS, um, I think people are going to be using that to create their CADs anyway. And so if you import the materials from SOLIDWORKS, then it'll have all those materials for you. Okay, and so let's go ahead and create our new material. And so we have, uh, we're gonna create aluminum, um, 6061, and then T6, okay. Okay, and then just like before, we're going to uh, define um, its isotropic elasticity. And so uh, making sure that you have your aluminum 6061 highlighted here, go ahead and click and drag isotropic elasticity to um, this bottom menu down here. And then let's go ahead and define the Young's modulus. And so the Young's modulus, let's turn this into PSI. And then let's um, set it to be one um, E7, just like in the problem document. And then we'll set the Poisson's ratio to 0 0.33 as well. Okay. Right. And so what that'll do is that will create a, a new material, aluminum 6061 for us. And then we can use this in our, um, in our ANSYS um, mechanical simulation. All right, so uh, anyone have any questions on um, loading in your um, separate uh, material here? Okay. All right, and so once you have your custom material loaded in, let's we can go ahead and close this, close this guy and bring us back to here. And then uh, in order to boot up ANSYS Mechanical, we're gonna double click model and this is going to bring up um, Ansys Mechanical for uh, for us. Okay. It's going to take it's going to take a couple minutes, and so we can go ahead and just kind of wait for it. Um, in the meantime. Okay. And so I, 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 I had already loaded this earlier, so I think mine might have been a little bit fast, but for you guys, it might, might still be kind of churning, uh, um, churning it out a little bit. 
Um, but once you have your, um, once your ANSYS mechanical boots up, you should be able to see the signpost that looks like this. And so you have one region up here for the sign and then the other region for the, the post. Okay. So it's a little bit, a little bit out of, a little bit not to scale compared to the, uh, uh, compared to the problem, um, you know, the figure in the, in the problem statement. Um, but, you know, these are, these are the, the dimensions that we're working with. Okay. Okay. And so once you have, um, you know, the signpost uh, loaded in, um, you know, what you should see here on this left-hand side are the three different aspects of our geometry, right? And so first thing we have is the post, right? And so that's the- a Question uh, in the chat, Professor. Oh, question? Yep. Oh, how to get the properties? Ah. You mean the uh, properties in the in the bottom left here, or back in the in the workbench? Ah. Let's see. So you mean uh um, for for these down for these down here? You mean in the bottom part of the screen? Okay. Yeah, go ahead and try uh, what people mentioned in the uh, um, in the chat. Yes. Yeah, so go to home and then manage and then details. So let me see if I can do that. Home. I don't even know where manage is. <laughs> Yeah, if you if you're not if you're not viewing it too, make sure that it's uh, it's check marked here on the view tab as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so now that we're um, now that we're in Ansys Mechanical here, um, you can see that we have three three parts to our CAD model, and so we have, um, and so when you click these, they they will highlight in the in the figure for you, right? And so if you um, click on post solid body, you'll see that the post for our sign post is gonna highlight, right? And then for the sign, you can see that part's highlighted, okay? And you see that we have uh, an additional surface here called an application surface, right? And so, um, you know, what this is actually is if you kind of rotate the, the sign over on, on its side, you'll see that there's this kind of additional, I, I call it almost like a ghost surface on, on the right, okay? And so it's almost like someone put, took a piece of tape and then ran it right down the side of our um, right down the side of our signpost. Okay. And so what this is is this is um, this is what I call like a, a phantom surface. And what this is going to allow us to do is it's it's going to allow us to apply our spatially varying force on the left hand side. Right. And so it's not actually like it's not a it's not an actual part in our um, you know in our in our in our geometry here, but its purpose is just to allow us to assign a and load. And so it's it's actually you know extremely thin. And so if you zoom in on it, you can see that it has basically no thickness. And it's basically been just been something that's been stamped or imprinted onto our um, onto our surface here. Okay. Um, and so Antis actually thinks of it as as like a two D surface as well. And so it doesn't have any actual real thickness. Um, but you know we need to assign it an actual like um, you know phantom thickness. And so basically what ANSYS is going to do is it's going to treat this like almost like our, our first ANSYS activity where the thickness that we gave it was just a numerical value, um, but the thickness wasn't anything that, you know, it's not going to be sticking out here, okay? And so if you click on this application surface right here and you go to the bottom left of the details window, you should see a, a yellow box here that tells you that the thickness here needs to be, it needs to be specified, okay? And so uh, right now it has a thickness of zero, and so that's going to give us an error. And so all we have to do here is we have to assign a thickness that's that's basically really really small, okay? Um, uh, and so that's it's this is just this is kind of just for formality's um, sake because this surface isn't a real one. It's, it's just for applying boundary conditions. But just to make sure that the the simulation runs without any errors, we have to give it a thickness, okay? All right, and so before we do that, make sure that your units, and so go to home and then units right here, make sure that you're in uh, inches, okay? Right, 
And then let's assign a thickness of one E minus three. Okay, so it's going to be 0 0.001 inches. And so it's basically going to be nothing, but you know, we have to put a number in there just so that ANSYS doesn't, um, doesn't throw us an error. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions so far on, on the, uh, on the geometry? Uh, home managed details is, is over here. I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so that's the, uh, that's the geometry. Okay. And so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to assign our materials. Okay. And so, um, you know, according to the problem specs, our post here, our post is going to be made of structural steel. And so you can see, you know, once you've highlighted post and you go to the bottom left, you can see that the assigned material assignment is structural steel. And then for the, for the sign itself, um, we're going to make this out of aluminum. Okay. And so you're going to click sign right here. And then you're going to go into the bottom left and you're going to select uh, aluminum uh, for the material. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and click that. And then now our sign is made of aluminum and our post is made of structural steel. Okay. And so when you're working with assemblies in ANSYS, you can assign different material properties to different parts of your, of your geometry. And a lot of times this is, this is what you want too, because you know, if you're bringing together an assembly of parts, um, oftentimes you're, you're machining them from different materials, right? You might make one part of your assembly out of one material and another part of your assembly out of a different material. And then in order to make sure that your finite element simulation is going to be accurate, you want to make sure that you assign the correct material properties to, you know, to each, um, to each part of your, um, of your system. Okay. Okay. All right. And so the next thing that we're going to look at is connections. And so this is, this is something that's new. Um, and so whenever you're working with an assembly, um, you have to define how the different parts of the assembly are going to interact with each other. Okay. And the way that you're going to do that is you're going to go to this left-hand side of the, of the project, and then you're going to expand this menu called connections, right? And so right now, probably your guide says looks like this. And so this connections menu is, is kind of minimized. And so you're going to click this plus arrow right here. And then you're going to open up this folder and then you're going to have a new folder called contacts. And then you're going to open up the contacts menu and you're going to see that there are three contact region here, three contact regions, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to define how each of the different parts in our assembly um, interact with each other. All right, and so if you click on the different contact regions, you'll see you know, which parts are being connected by, by what, okay? And so you'll see kind of two new menus that pop up here on the right-hand side. And on the, top, um, you know, on the top figure, you'll see you know, the first part that's being connected. And in the bottom figure, you'll see the other part that's being connected uh, for this region, okay? And if you kind of zoom in here and you can kind of rotate in here, you can see that the contact region in between these two um, parts is highlighted in, in red, okay, or blue, okay. And so in this in this case, you know, um, contact region one, this is the contact region in between the sign and the post, okay. And so on on this basically on this surface, this is where they're interacting. Okay? And so what you can define here is is you know how this contact region is actually going to interact. And so you're going to click on this contact region here, and then you're going to go to the bottom left, um, you know, and you can define the type for this uh, for this um, for this connection. Right? And so right now it's it's set to bonded, and so what bonded basically says is that the two the two parts are basically welded together. And so you know, ANSYS is when the connections are bonded, then ANSYS is basically going to treat it so that you know the two are are basically welded together. And so you know when they move then there's going to be no slipping or sliding in between those parts. Okay. Um, and so that's actually what we want here. And so we want, we want our signpost to actually be kind of glued to our, our um, to our sign. And so we don't want any sliding or any movement in between those. Okay. okay. Um, but if you, if you expand this type here for the connections, you can see all the different options that you have. Right. And so at first you have bonded, but then you can also make it so that they don't separate. And so what no separation means is that, you know, they, they still have to be connected to each other, but then they're able to kind of slide past each other, you know, um, like so, okay? And, for, and so, you know, for a, a situation like um, where you don't want them to separate, but you want them to slide, you know, that's, that's one thing that you can do there, okay? 
Frictionless, I think, is something similar. And so frictionless, I think, just assumes that they can slide past each other without any, any friction, right? Um, but I think with frictionless, I think you kind of allow them to separate, you know, under some, under some, with some constraints. And then rough and frictional, I think, are, are roughly the same things too. And so with those, with those situations, you know, the, the two parts can slide past each other, um, but there might be some friction, but you, you can specify a friction force to kind of keep them, you know, held together. Um, and so, you know, if you have two things, like say that you have a, you know, um, you know, a bearing that's inside, you know, that's being squeezed by, you know, um, another part, then you can apply a frictional support here that to define that basically that friction force. Right? And so there's a lot of options here on how you can define, you know, how two parts will mate together. Um, but for this activity, we're just going to go with the simplest one, which is a bonded connection. Right? And so a bonded, remember, just you can basically assume that they're kind of welded together like that. And then uh, from here, you can check out the regions for the other ones, okay? And so if you highlight contact region two, and then what you'll see is that this is the connection in between our, um, our tape surface or our phantom surface and the post, right? And so that's what you see here in these, uh, in these windows. And then contact region three is the connection in between our phantom surface and the side, okay? And you can see kind of the surfaces where they're highlighted, okay? All right. Um, any questions? Any questions on on this so far on contact regions? Check the chat. Um, professor. Yeah. Do they always like auto populate with them, or do we have to ever like specify them? Right. So that's that's a good question. So when we when you um, when you um, upload a, um, a an assembly that's already been kind of created in SolidWorks or in Ansys, um, these will be automatically populated for you, and the default will be bonded. Um, but you know there there might be some situations, and we'll see this in Ansys Activity Five, um, where you might want to modify the geometry basically after you've uploaded the assembly. And so whenever you do that, then it kind of um, it kind of destroys all the automatic connections, and so you're you're gonna have to specify those manually. Um, but if you if you're just uploading an assembly and you're just kind of loading it in, then it'll auto populate for you. Okay. All right, and so um, you know this part's this part's optional right here, um, but I think it's it's kind of a good practice to, to get into, um, you know, and for and for and for an activity like this, it might seem trivial because we only have three parts, um, but if you're working with an assembly with you know a lot of different parts that are interacting, you know, it's it's going to help you a lot to to label these these contact regions, right? And so just like Arjun mentioned, you know, it's uh, you know even though you know Ansys is going to be auto populating these for you. You know, usually it's a good idea to to name these um, to something that's a little bit more useful. Because right now, contact region one, contact region two, contact region three is, is not the most helpful thing in the world. And so let's go ahead and rename this. And so you can rename a contact region by right clicking this and clicking rename. Okay. And so usually, you know, what we want to rename these two are it, uh, we want to rename this to the the two parts of our geometry that we're um, you know that we're connected. And so for this contact region one, we're doing a contact between the post and the sign, okay? And so I'm gonna rename this the post sign connection. Okay. okay. And then for this one, um, you know, this is the contact in between our phantom surface and the post. And so we go ahead and rename this. And so if you, uh, another, another shortcut for this is to rename it just to hit F2 on your keyboard. And so we'll call that phantom post connection. And this last one we'll call this phantom sign connection. Okay. All right. And so again, you know, that's you know optional. And so you know, you don't have to do that, but uh, for larger projects and for larger assemblies, you know, this this will help you stay organized, especially as you're going through and debugging your um, debugging your um, your stuff. Okay. And so with that, you know, we're ready to start meshing. And so, um, you know, now that we have this geometry here um, and we define these connections, you know, now we have to put a mesh on this guy. Right? And so same, things be same thing that we did before. And so we're gonna specify our mesh settings in this kind of meshing um, area here, okay? Um, and we're actually gonna define a separate meshing um, parameters for the sign and separate meshing parameters for the post. The phantom surface, we, we don't have to worry about meshing it because remember, it ju it's just there to apply the load. And so we're only just gonna mesh the sign and the post. Okay? 
And so I'm going to leave most of this these up to you, uh, but well, I'll show you what I want at least. And so for um, both the sign and the post, I want you to have both a method and a sizing object. Okay. And so go ahead. You can go ahead and right click mesh and click insert method. Okay. And then let's make this first method for the sign, right? And so you're going to click um, on the sign in your uh, in the 3D window to make sure it's highlighted green. And then go ahead and click apply for the geometry. Okay. And you can go in here and you can you can select the uh, you know the element order and the, the shape. Okay. So I'll let you guys do that. Okay. And I also want you to create a sizing object for the sign as well. Okay. And so same thing, we're going to right click mesh click insert and then click sizing. And then you're gonna click on the sign. You're gonna click apply, okay. Um, and then we're gonna do the same things for the post. And so we're gonna right click mesh, click insert, click method. And then we're gonna click on the post, okay. And the same thing, we're gonna right click mesh, insert sizing, click on the post, okay. And so in total, you should have um, four, um, four settings under mesh. And so you should have a method object for the sign, a sizing object for the sign, a method object for the post, and a sizing object for the post um, as well. Okay. Right. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to leave these as the default for now, but um, you can definitely feel free to go in and change it. Um, and at the end of, at the, at the end of the activity today, I'll, I'll give you some, um, some kind of rules of thumb to help you with the, with the mesh sizing as well. Okay. Because so far, you know, with the mesh sizing, I've I've kind of just told you just to you know make make sure it looks like a a, a, fair, a relatively fine mesh. Uh, but there's a lot of metrics that you can actually use to to see you know whether you need a more refined mesh um, or whether you need a refinement in a certain area or you know maybe you can um, coarsen the mesh in certain areas too. Okay, uh, but we'll talk about that more kind of after the results because it makes a bit more sense there. Okay. Um, professor. Yep. Is there a way to make like variables for them so that like if you change a value in one of the sizing, it like you it links to the other and it'll change the other, or do you have to just create it separately always? Yeah, so I, I think um, I think there's ways that you can you can program that, and so you know I, I think a lot of these methods here, like for the sizing, I think you can you can refer to the sizing in another one. I I haven't done it I haven't done it before, but you know what you'll see what you'll see in the when we do this the distrib the the distributed load. Is that these um, you know these entries here for the body sizing they can also take variables as well and so I think you can define it so that everything is scaled by a certain variable um, I just I just personally haven't tried it um, myself um, mm -hmm. but I, I think I think you can I think you can do that yeah gotcha mm -hmm. all right and so same thing that we did with the connections you know just so that you know you don't have to just look at automatic method one and automatic method two uh, we can rename these. And so since this is for the sign right here, I'm going to do sign mesh method. Okay. And then for the sizing, I'm going to do sign uh, mesh sizing. Okay. And so I, I do underscores just because I've, I've worked in Linux a lot and, and Linux likes underscores, but you don't have to do underscores. You can just do spaces. Okay. All right. And so for this, since this is for the post, so I'm going to do post mesh method and then I'm going to rename the sizing into post mesh sizing okay and so just just so that you know when you're going back and changing things later it's it's a bit easier for you to kind of uh, see what's going on okay okay uh, any questions on the on the meshing stuff Yeah. Okay. All right. And so now that we're done with the meshing, you know, remember, you know, I, I want you guys to actually go in and, and change these. And so don't leave them on the defaults. Um, but for now, let's go ahead and move on to the loading because the loading is going to be um, fairly complex here. Okay. All right. So actually, first thing we're going to do, let's, let's go ahead and fix this guy to the ground. And so let's go ahead and um, right click static structural A5. Let's go ahead and insert, and then we're going to insert a fixed port here. Okay, um, and so um, you know when we go ahead and click fix support, and we're going to fix the we're going to fix the signpost on the very bottom of it. Okay, and so you know when you're selecting the surface, make sure that the bottom is is selected here. And let's go ahead and select that. Okay, 
And so now our signpost is fixed to the ground. Um, and so, you know, when we apply our loading, then our sign isn't going to go flying off into infinity. Okay. And so I, I, I sometimes I forget to put the fixed supports. So I, I want to do that um, right away um, just to kind of, um, you know, help with that. Okay. And so let's go ahead and start applying our loads. And so in this particular activity, we have four loads that we're working with. Okay. And so the first load um, that we have, let me go back up here. Okay. The first load that we're going to apply is this FZ1. And this FZ1 is going to be the weight of the, of the post. Okay. And so let's go ahead and apply that as a force load. Okay. And so let's go ahead and right click static structural A5 and then insert, and then we're gonna insert a force, okay? Okay, and so if we go back to the, uh, if we go back to the diagram on our ANSYS activity, you can see that this force is being applied at this um, surface right here, okay? So it's being applied at the top of the post, and this is gonna represent the weight of our, um, of our post, okay? All right, and so what we need to do is we need to be able to specify this, this surface kind of up here. All right. Okay, but we have a problem here, and so because that that um, inner surface right here is is covered by the sign, you know, we we're not actually able to select it because if we try to zoom in here, and we try to click on that surface in the middle, what we click on instead is the entire exterior surface of the post, which is not what we want, right? And so what we want to do is we want to apply this force right on this the top of this uh, of this post right here, and so you can kind of see it. It's kind of highlighted when I mouse over it, just like just like that. Okay, but right now this sign is in the way, and we can't we can't apply a force there. And so this is pretty common because you know a lot of times you want to apply a load on something that might be covered up by another part of your geometry. Right? But luckily, what we can do is we can just simply hide these surfaces. And so um, you know since we don't want the sign for this for this first application of the force, we're going to right click sign right here, and we're going to click hide body. Okay. And that's going to hide our body here. And so now what we can do is we can click on this um, part of the post and then click apply. Okay. Right. And so for cases where you know you want to apply a load on a part of your geometry that's hidden by another part, all you have to do is just hide the other part from the geometry up here. And then from there you can um, you can apply the um, the loads. Okay. All right. And so what's the what's the magnitude of the load that we're going to apply here? Okay. Right, and so the magnitude of the of the load that we're going to apply is going to be the weight of this post. Okay, and in the problem document, what I told you is is to compute the weight based on you know um, you know the volume of this um, of this post multiplied by the density. Okay. All right, and so I'm going to show you um, basically you know how you can look up things like um, volume and surface area for your for your CAD parts in, in ANSYS. Um, because because you know you're loading in these CAD files, you know ANSYS can compute these things automatically. Right? And so what we're going to need is we're going to need um, um, basically the volume of this post so that we can compute its weight. Okay. All right. And so um, in order to do that, let's go back up to geometry up here and go ahead and click on the post. Okay. And so make sure that your post is selected just like just like that. Okay. And if we're going to and then we're going to come down to the bottom left of the screen here. And then we're going to click on properties. Okay? And so when we expand this um, properties menu here, you can start to see, um, you know, all the different properties that we have um, listed for this uh, for this part. Okay? Uh, and so you can see here that we have the volume in inches cubed. And so this post should have a volume of forty-seven thousand three hundred twenty-eight um, inches cubed. Okay. Um, and here we actually have the weight of of this um, of this post already. And so the weight is, uh, we can see it's uh, 13,422, and this is in pound mass, okay? Um, and the reason we have this weight is because, remember, this post is made of structural steel, right? Um, and, the, and for structural steel, you know, ANSYS has already input the density in for, for that. And so what ANSYS basically does is that internally, it, it multiplies the volume of your post uh, multiplied by the density to give you the, um, the mass. Uh, which in this case, you know, we're going to take it to be the force as well because we're in we're in English units, okay? Uh, but if you look at you know the sign right here, okay, and so I'm now I'm looking at the properties for the sign. Remember when we assigned our our custom aluminum property, we didn't assign its density, and so all we did was we assigned its Young's modulus, 
And so when uh, an ANSYS tries to compute its mass, you can see that it has, you know, ANSYS thinks that it has a mass of zero, which, you know, obviously it's not, it's not, it's not true, right? And so, um, you know, if you want, if you want, basically, if you want ANSYS to automatically compute your mass or your, or your weight, you need to input the density back when we, back when we assign our custom material properties. Right. Okay. And so uh, from this post, you can see that we have a, um, a weight um, of, of 13,422 pounds. And so let's go ahead and apply that as a force here. Okay. All right. And so same thing that we've done before. And so, um, you know, we're, uh, in order to give us some more flexibility on, um, you know, on the directions on where we can apply the force, we're going to change the force defined by from vector into components. Okay. And so when we change this to components, you can see now that we have the X, Y, Z components of the velocity. And we can see that the vertical direction of the, of the, uh, of this, of this model is in the Z direction. Okay. And so to apply a weight of 13,422, we're going to apply it right here. So we're going to do a minus 13,422 pound force. Okay. And so here we have a vertical force of um, 13,422, which is simulating the weight of this post itself. And it's being applied on this surface um, right up here. And so you'll see kind of an arrow that kind of specifies, specifies that. Okay, uh, any questions on, on this so far? All right, question. So wouldn't the weight of the pole be at the bottom? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. And actually, you know, that's one of the issues that I have with this activity as well. Um, actually, you know, the weight, the weight, you know, the, the, the best way to, to uh, apply the weight is to have it, have it as like a body force that you're, that you're distributing all throughout this, this surface. And so if you want to actually do it as a point force, you know, where you would actually put it would be at the center of mass or the centroid, which would be over here. And so the fact that we're applying it, you know, up here is, is definitely an approximation. Um, but the reason we're doing that is because the, the centroid is, is not easily, you know, um, obtainable here. Okay. Um, I will, I will, I will mention that, you know, there, there is a different way to apply weight because weight is such a common thing for you to apply in these ANSYS simulations. If you right click on static structural and you click insert here, you can see that there's, where is it? There's a load that you can apply here for standard earth gravity. And what this does is it basically applies a, a gravity force at the center, at the centroid of your, of your object. Okay. Uh, but in order to use this, you know, you need to apply, you basically need to specify a density for all the materials that you're using in this model. And so, you know, for this, for this case, because we didn't apply a density for the aluminum, um, if we do standard earth gravity, then it's only going to consider the weight of just this, um, of just this post right here. Um, but normally, if you want to consider the weight of all the objects in your, in your simulation, you can just apply that standard earth gravity, you know, um, and that'll take care of, that'll take care of the weight and it'll apply the weight, you know, at the centroid of your, of your object. Uh, but in this case, because we didn't apply a density for our sign, you know, we're, we're going to apply the weight kind of manually here. And we're, and, you know, just because of the way that, you know, uh, we're applying forces, we're, we're limited basically to just exterior surfaces. And so that's why we're applying the, the weight up here. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. It's a fair, definitely a fair question. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now that we have the weight of the post up here, um, now we can apply the weight of the sign itself. Right. And so again, you know, we're going to do this as an approximation, but we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to apply the weight at the very top of this sign. And so we're going to right click um, set structural. We're going to insert a force. Okay. And then this time we're going to select the top, the very top surface of our sign. And we're going to apply that there. Okay. And then we're going to change this to components. And then now we're going to input the weight of the sign. And the weight of the sign is 14,000 pounds. And so we're going to do minus 14,000. Okay. And that's going to be a minus 14,000 pounds that we're applying at the very, at the very top. And that's going to be distributed over the entire surface. Okay. Right, question. Yeah. So the mass was given in pound mass um, and not in pound force. Right. And so you know this. Uh, um, you know this. Um, the weight that we're actually applying here. You're right. So this. Um, you know this mass here is in pound mass. You know, but we're applying it as if it was a pound uh, force. And so in this in this case, we're kind of you know just assuming that they're. Um, but they're the same. 
Uh, but you know, in real life, you know, you would uh, you would actually apply kind of the actual pound force in, in actual force units here. Um, and so, you know, I'm I'm working in kind of U.S. Um, customary units here in English units, just because that's that's kind of what you know how I wrote this activity. Um, but you know, um, normally, you know, I um, you know um, if you're more comfortable working in SI units, then it's a lot more clear, you know, the difference between kilograms for mass and newtons for for force for for that. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a good point. Um, but for this activity, you know, we're, we're just kind of working, uh, learning on, you know, how to apply forces at different places. But and so the actual units for the force um, um, don't don't matter too much for, for this activity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so uh, now that we've applied the weights for the post and the weight for the sign, um, now we can go ahead and apply um, our wind forces. Okay. All right. And so the first wind force that we're going to apply is going to be um, a perpendicular force on the sign itself. And so we're going to apply basically a force F1Y right here. Okay. All right. And so we're going to right click static structural. We're going to insert another force. Okay. And then now we need to select the point where we're going to apply the force. Okay. And so this force is going to be a little bit different because it's, it's not a force that's distributed over this entire surface we're only applying this force at a single point. And so you can almost think of this as like a point, a point force. Right? Okay. And so in order to get this at a point, we need to change our selection mode. And so right now we're on the selection mode for a face, which is going to select an entire face or entire surface. And so we need to change this to a vertex, right? And so on this, on this um, kind of um, bar right here, kind of um, near the middle of the screen, make sure that you have vertex selected um, for the uh, for this force, okay. And then what you're going to need to do is you're it's it's a little bit hard to find, and so it's a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack. But you're gonna you know move your mouse around until you hit kind of the middle of the sign. And then when you're in the middle of the sign, so let me kind of zoom in a little bit so you can see a bit better. Okay. And so when you're in the middle of the sign, what you should see is that a little gray dot should show up when you're kind of moused over the appropriate spot. And so I'll, I'll kind of leave that there for you for you to kind of see in, in the Zoom call. And so that's the point where we're going to apply our, our force. Is there a point like that at the center of the post that we could have used to uh, apply the force to? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So this this point was actually manually added um, to this CAD file. And so when I when I created this CAD file, I, I, I manually put that point in there in inside the CAD program. And so if you try to mouse over, you know, a point in the center of the post, you're, you're not going to find anything. Um, so we can kind of, you know, go ahead and try that. Um, and so if you want to apply, you know, forces at a point like this, you kind of have to, you kind of have to put the point kind of manually yourself in the, in the CAD software. Yeah. Uh, but this one, this one I added for you. And so all you have to do is kind of just um, find it in the middle. All right. And so let's go ahead and click that point. And so when you click that point, it should highlight green. And then you're going to go ahead and click apply right here. And when you click apply, you can see that you know we're um, you know we're applying this at a single vertex, okay. Um, and then um, just like before, we're going to change this um, direction here to components, and then we're going to apply the magnitude of our wind force, okay. And our wind force will be uh, positive eight thousand um, pounds in the y direction. And so you can see that when I apply this uh, force of 8,000 pounds, then we have a force going into the, into the signpost applied at that point. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions on, on this? Uh, why wouldn't you apply the, uh, the 8,000 to the entire face of the sign? Yeah. No, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a good question. And so, uh, and so that's definitely one way that you can, uh, you can do it. Um, but for this uh, for this activity, you know, I, I wanted to show you how to apply a force at a point, and so that's that's kind of why I, I did that for for that. But um, but definitely, you know, for a wind force, you know, we're, you know, wind is usually distributed over an entire um, entire face, an entire surface. Um, normally, you would um, you would apply the wind over the entire surface. But just to kind of give you a, a um, just to kind of give you a demonstration for how to apply force at a point, um, that's kind of why I did this for uh, for this activity. Okay, and so that's our um, first wind force, and so now we're going to apply um, the second wind force, which is you know this is where we're going to utilize this um, this kind of phantom surface right here. Okay. Okay, 
Um, and so um, we're going to apply this force as a pressure. Okay. And so we're going to right click on um, static structural and we're going to insert a pressure load. Okay. Right. Um, and so we're going to um, apply this pressure load on this phantom surface. Okay. And so you're going to have to click on just this surface right here. And you might have to kind of mouse around a little bit. Okay. Right. And so you want to make sure that just this um, phantom surface here is, is highlighted. Okay. Right. And so with that highlighted, so go ahead and click um, apply. Okay. And so now you have, now we're applying a force in that direction. Okay. All right. And so before moving forward, um, you know, just to make sure that, you know, you get the right force, you want to make sure that your units here are in inches and pound, uh, pound mass and pound force. Okay, because that's that's kind of the distrib that's kind of the formula for this the distributed load um, that I give you in the problem document. Okay, and so if we go to the problem document, you can see that here is the formula for our distributed load. It's going to be zero point one times z, and so z being the um, the vertical um, the vertical component here, or the vertical um, dimension. Okay, and that's going to give you um, psi. And so our formula is basically 0.1 times z. And so that's what we're going to apply here. And so you're going to go on the bottom left of the, uh, of the details menu where you see the magnitude of the pressure force. And what you're going to do is you're going to do equal. Okay? And so this is just like um, Excel. And so if in Excel, um, you know that if you, when you want to input a formula into Excel, um, you're going to use a, an equal sign. Okay? And so you're going to do an equal 0.1. Okay? And you can do times z. Okay, and so that tells um, ANSYS that this is going to be a spatially varying um, distributed load, and where it's going to increase as you increase in, in Z. Okay. All right, and so um, you can go ahead and click Enter on that. Okay. And then what you should see um, is that our load should be, um, you know, um, applied just like this. Okay. All right. And then uh, what you can do from here is you can um, basically check the magnitude of this uh, um, of this force, okay? And then um, basically you should see that the um, you should see a graph that kind of looks like uh, looks like this, okay? Right. And so you should see a, a maximum of uh, basically three point nine three seven psi, okay? And then um, you know a minimum of zero. And so what that tells us that you know our Distributed load is going to start out with zero psi here at the bottom, and it's going to reach a maximum of three point nine seven psi at the top right here. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting two hundred and one is equal to three point two eight. Um, two hundred one is equal to three point two eight. Uh, where where are you getting that? Like, or so for the tabular data mm -hmm. on the right hand side, yeah. my point. 201 is 3.2808, and then the pressure is 0 0.32808. I see, I see. Do um, you have your units here as, um, as as this one right here? Oh. Inches. Oh, wait, I think that might have fixed it. Yep, that fixed it. OK, great. Yeah, you want to make sure, you definitely want to make sure that you're in the right units for this, because otherwise otherwise you're going to get a different um, unload here. Right? Because what, what ANSYS is basically assuming is that this Z coordinate here is in inches. Um, okay, yeah. Mine was in feet then, I think. Okay, nice, nice. Okay. All right. Okay, and so that's all the loads and that's all our supports. Um, and so, um, you know, we're, uh, we're ready to start simulating. And so uh, just like we did before, let's go ahead and rename all of these forces because, you know, we have a lot here, right? And so this first, for this first um, force right here um, this was the weight of our post. Okay. Okay. The second force here was the weight of our sign. Oops, I don't want help. Okay. okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. This third force here was our um, wind. Um, our wind force are applied at a point. Okay. And this pressure force right here was our spatially varying pressure. Okay. All right. 
and so that's uh, that's basically all the the setup for this uh, for this problem. And so just like before, we're going to define our um, outputs. And so for now, let me just define the total deformation and the equivalent stress. Okay. And so I think in the in the in the document, I asked you to uh, to do more, uh, but let's start with let's start with that. And then let's go ahead and click solve and then let uh, ANSYS go ahead and solve this guy for us. All right, and so now you can see our, our mesh. Right. And you can see here, here is our results. Okay. Right. And so you can see here that uh, compared to our base geometry, our sign folks is kind of leaning, leaning to the right a little bit. And so the effect of all, basically all of the weights and all of the loading is basically causing the, the signpost to, to tilt, okay? How and big you, was your mesh again? Uh, let me see. My mesh was uh, 4,213 elements. I mean, what did you do for the sizing of it? I just left, I just you... left it as the default for now. And so- Oh, I, okay. Yeah, I want you guys to play with it, but for now, um, you know, um, just do the default. But I'll, I'll show you something that you can use as, as kind of a criterion to help you refine your, your mesh. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at let's look at the stress field first. Right? And so for the stress field, you can see we have a maximum stress of about twenty six thousand eight hundred twenty nine uh, psi. Okay, and then you know we can follow the colors here to to let us know uh, where that maximum is occurring. Right? And you can see that maximum is occurring kind of at this um, at this kind of small region right here where the signpost is fixed, right? And so basically the signpost is kind of bending over and most of the most of the bending stress that the signpost is experiencing is down here, okay? All right. Um, and so, um, you know, you, you can get these simulation results and you might think that they're, um, that they're okay, right? Um, but, you know, um, I'll, let me tell you guys a, a metric that, um, that I typically use to, to refine our, my mesh, okay? And so actually, you know, the first time I run a, a, a finite element simulation, I usually start with the default mesh values just like this. Um, but then what I do is I refine my mesh based on the results. Okay? And so from these results, you can see that we have a, a really high stress concentration here on the post. Okay? Um, but then, you know, you have a very large um, change here. Right? And so the stress basically goes from almost zero on this side. And then in a very short distance, that stress kind of maximizes here at 28,000, you know, almost 27,000 psi. Okay, and so whenever I see areas in my um, in my uh, geometry where the stress is changing really rapidly, basically this tells me that you know maybe I should refine my mesh in these areas because uh, the refined mesh, um, what the refined mesh will do is it, it'll basically help help it so that you know you can compute these more accurately because uh, you can because uh, you know uh, what you can imagine basically is that at this node of this mesh right here. You know, this node is basically experiencing very, very low stress, but then we go two nodes over and then this node is, is suddenly experiencing a ton of stress, right? And so we have a very large change from no stress to ton of stress in a very short amount of time, okay? Usually you don't wanna see that. And so usually, you know, when you have your finite element simulation, you know, um, it's okay to have large changes in stress over a short period of time, but what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that there's, there's enough elements that kind of, you know, are in between that and so, um, you don't have a huge change in stress, you know, over a two element span. Okay. And so what these results tell me is that, you know, maybe I should refine my mesh in the post. Okay. And so let me go to my post sizing here and let me refine this. And so right now it's at a size of seven point, um, basically seven inches. And so let me refine this. Let me cut this in half. And so let me um, refine this to a mesh size of 3.5. Okay. So let me go ahead and hit solve again. And so what that's going to do, it's going to refine the mesh in this area. Simulation is going to take a little bit longer because it's a little bit more expensive. Okay. And what you can see now is that the, the stress has changed, right? And so before, you know, remember we had a maximum stress of about 20, a little bit less than 27,000. Now by refining the mesh in this area, now we have a maximum stress of about, um, you know, a little bit over 27,000. So it went up by about, um, you know, 500 PSI, okay? And that's and that's not insignificant, and so that's that's pretty big. Okay, and so the change here you can see here is that you know before when we had this really low stress on this node right here, you know we we basically just jumped over two elements and we we're already at a really high stress, and so now we're going from this really low stress 
And now we have to jump over, you know, what is it? One, two, three elements in order to reach this, this stress. Okay. And so it might not seem like that big a change. And so going from a two element jump to a three element, but you can see that it changed the results pretty significantly. Okay. And let me check to see the size of the mesh. All right, and so we're still pretty good. And so we're still only at 6,000 elements. And so let me go ahead and you know, decrease this size even more. So let me change this from three down to two. Okay. Let's go ahead and run the simulation again. Of course, the simulation is taking longer because I, I refined the mesh. And now let's look at the stress again. And you can see the results have changed again, right? And so, um, you know, our, our stress actually went down this time. And so we went from a high of 27,000. Now we're down or closer to 26,000, okay? Um, and you can see, but, you know, as we refine the mesh, what you're seeing is that this stress concentration here, it's, it's kind of smoothing out this, this contour, right? And so if you kind of remember from the beginning, you know, we had kind of, you know, just one kind of splotchy, um, one kind of splotch of stress right here. Now we kind of have a much more cleaner, much more smooth distribution of, of stress, okay? Uh, okay, yeah, so you, you can't go too crazy with the, with the mesh refinement because uh, um, the, uh, the, the maximum is about 32,000. And so if you have your um, mesh here and you and you have over 32,000 elements then it's it's going to cause a it's going to cause a problem. Yeah. And so you can't go too crazy here. Um, and so actually I'm kind of surprised that I have 70,000 nodes and it hasn't crashed on me. Um, and I haven't pirated ANSYS, at least not at least not to my uh, at least not to my knowledge I haven't. Um, and but the but the but the limit that they that they usually apply on this is is 32,000. Okay. All right. And so if you're running into the numerical limits, you know, I'll give you kind of another pro tip here, right? Because right now what we're doing is we're changing the size of the elements over this entire, over this entire post, right? But really the only area that we want to apply this refinement is in this area right here where we, where we have kind of this high stress concentration, right? And so what we want is we, we want to refine the mesh here, but then we don't really want to refine it over here, okay? And so kind of what we're doing is that, you know, since our mesh is so refined in this area, we're kind of doing a lot of uh, extra work for nothing because you know refining the mesh up here for us does does nothing for us, right? Uh, but luckily, you know, we have a, a tool that will allow us to refine in a certain area, right? And that's the refinement tool. And so let me go back here and let me change the element size for this back up to seven, okay? And let me insert a refinement here, okay? And then let me go refine just in this area, okay? So let me go ahead and click apply, okay? And so, you know, you can either refine just around this edge, but I'm going to refine just around this whole bottom surface, and that's going to refine all the elements in this area, okay? And I'm going to apply a 3x refinement to that. And so let me just generate the mesh for that, just so you can kind of see what it, uh, what it looks like, okay? Right. And you can see now that, uh, now that we have a much more refined mesh just in this area, but in every other location in our, in our post, you know, we have a much more coarse mesh. And so this is going to be much more efficient now because now we refine this, you know, to be three times smaller, but we've kept the element count here down uh, quite a bit. Okay, and so that's still not quite as fine as I want. So actually, let me go ahead and refine this a little bit. And so let me turn this into um, five. Okay, so let me go ahead and generate this mesh. Okay, and so it's a little bit better. So let me go ahead and refine just a little bit more. Right, so let me change this sizing here to uh, 3.5. Okay, so let me go ahead and generate this mesh again. Okay, and so now we're back on a 3.5 mesh, but now this area down here is mesh, you know, three times as fine as that. Okay, and so let's go ahead and run the simulation again. Let's look at our equivalent stress, right? And you can see now that our, um, you know, our stress um, concentration has changed quite a bit again, okay? But it's not uh, showing me where the maximum is. So actually, let me go see where the max is. Result. 
Let's see. Okay. All right. And so if you want to see, if you want to see where the maximum of your stress concentration is, uh, one thing that you can do is you can use this, uh, you can go into results into ANSYS and then click uh, maximum and minimum. And so that'll tell you where your maximum stress is and where your minimum stress is. Okay. All right. And so from this, we're able to see that the maximum stress is occurring at this lip right here. Okay. Right at the bottom where we, where we refined our mesh quite a bit. Okay. And the minimum is probably somewhere up here that we don't really care about. When you did the mesh refinement, click on the edge or on the bottom face? Yeah, so I, I think it'll work on either one. And so basically what you're telling Ansys is, you know, I want to refine just in this in this area. And so I, I clicked on the whole bottom face, but you can click on just the edge. I think, it, I think it'll work the same way. And then can you go back to your refinement real quick, please? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, cool, thank you. Yep. And so, you know, I think this is probably the first time that we've seen this, that, you know, what we choose for the mesh or, you know, how we, how we choose the mesh and how we refine it um, is having a big impact on the results, right? And so you can see, you know, we did three, basically three different meshing configurations and we got three different, uh, very different values for this stress, okay? And in fact, you know, the location of the stress changed as well. And so instead of, you know, being the maximum stress on the outside here, now we have a maximum compressive stress here on the inside, okay? Right. And so um, generally, you know, what you want to do, you know, and, you know, and I'll, and I'll stress this for the final project too, that when you're running your final, your finite element simulations, you want to have a good refined mesh in the areas of stress concentration, just to make sure that you have, you know, an accurate solution in those areas. Okay. All right. And so let's go ahead and refine this one more time. Let's, let me change this to 2.5. Let's go ahead and run the, uh, run the solution again. Let's look at the stress after it's done loading, of course. Okay. And you can see as we refine the mesh again, you know, the stress, the stress has gone up yet again. Okay. And so it's occurring, you know, right at this, at this bottom lip. And so, you know, how you mesh your surface and, you know, what you choose for, for that is going to have a really big impact on the, on the results. Okay. And so for this, uh, for this, you know, um, for this activity, uh, you know, don't, don't worry about it too, too much. Um, Cause we'll, we'll be going over kind of formal ways that you can refine the mesh. Um, but I did want to take this opportunity to, to kind of show you that, you know, what you choose for the mesh, you know, it does have an impact on your, on your results, especially in areas of, of stress concentration. Okay. Um, um, the reality is for, for this particular, um, for this particular problem, you know, because we have a, a fixed support here on the bottom and we have kind of, you know, sharp, sharp corners here, no matter what, um, actually, you know, um, and you can, you can derive this theoretically too, you know, as we refine this mesh more and more and more, actually the stress is going to keep climbing up and up and up. Um, and so, you know, um, usually what you want to do is you want to avoid situations like this by putting like a nice fillet or something right here. But because we have the sharp corner and the sharp corner is right next to a fixed support um, and, there's, and there's bending that's involved, you know, no matter what, you're gonna have a really high stress concentration. Um, and that's you know, just strictly just a, kind of a, a weakness of the numerics. Um, you know, and so if you were doing this something for your project, if you're doing something like this for your project, I would tell you to you know, add a fillet around this area so that you know, we can avoid these high stress concentrations. Um, but, but this was just a demonstration just to show you that you know, how you choose the mesh and how you refine it will, will have a big impact on your, on your results. All right, any final questions on this activity before we, uh, we wrap up for today? Let me check the chat. How did you get the, the little max label? Yeah, so the max label, what I did was uh, when you're on the results here, you click on results on top and then you click on this, uh, this button right here for maximum and minimum. So it's kind of uh, in the middle of the screen. So make sure you have results highlight at the top and then click uh, maximum right there. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I see some questions in the in the chat. Okay. Oh, sorry. Missed a bunch of questions in the chat. Okay. All right, so Houston's question, is this a mesh convergence test? It's, it's part of it. And so you would definitely do this as part of a mesh convergence test, uh, but a mesh convergence test is a little bit more formal. You, you would actually you know write down what your mesh density was and what the maximum stress was. Yeah. Okay. 
can we move the mesh refinement higher? You mean higher? Um, you mean higher on the model? Um, you would have to you would have to basically create a surface on here where you can actually select it. So right now, you know, with Ansys, and this is kind of one of the things I don't like about Ansys is that you're you're limited to just the surfaces that you can kind of select on the exterior. Right? If you wanted to select a different part, you know, you kind of have to go into the CAD and and kind of um, create a separate part of the geometry that you can actually select. So kind of like exactly what I did for this point right here. And so for this, uh, you know, for this part, you know, when we're adding the refinement. You know, because we can only select the bottom of um, of the surface here, we can only you know refine around refine around there. Hey, professor. Yep. Yeah, in SolidWorks, there's a there's a thing you can do. I can't remember the name of it right now, but you can reflect a, a sketch onto your onto your part, and that creates a boundary that you can you can select from. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's definitely one way that you can uh, you can do it too. Um, I, I have I have a workshop later on how you can do that in Ansys, but if you can do that in SolidWorks too, that's that's even better. And so um, just like um, you know what Chris said in, in SolidWorks, what you can do is you can basically project a sketch onto this model where you can have basically an area where you can select here as well. And so that's that's basically another another way that you can do it. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, Josh's question is: Can we use the WX2 plane for refinement? Um, yeah, so you can you can add refinement around that plane um, as well, and that will that will also refine it. But that will refine it, you know, all throughout all throughout the sides of your of your model. Mm -hmm. Oh, convert entities. Uh, where's that? Is that here on um, in Ansys? No, it's a SolidWorks function. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Convert entity. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up on that question for the mm -hmm. uh, refinement. Does refinement go deeper or does it just say like uh, like that scalar number? Does it say how many like divisions it goes into per? Yeah, so that number that you're basically defining is that you, you want you want basically three times as many elements in this um, in this area. And okay. so um, you know if you kind of zoom in here, you can basically kind of see that these elements, it's kind of hard, but you can basically squeeze three of these trying, like if you look at this kind of triforce that I'm kind of highlighting with my mouse. That you can squeeze that into you know one of, of these ones, and so you're making a mesh that's basically three times three times smaller. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Professor. Yep. Um, mine just was like completely blue, and the stress was like way lower than yours. And for uh -huh. some reason, the max was at the top of the post. Okay. Do you have Do you have all the loads here um, applied in kind of the same way? Yeah, I've like doubled and triple checked them with our June. Okay, okay. Hmm. Do you what do you see for the deformation? So do you have a, a deformation field that looks like like this? Yeah, the deformation looks um, the same. Okay. Ish, oh. except it's like way less deformation. Like I have blue that extends. Can I just share my screen? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, disabled. Oh. You go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There it is. Okay. Oh, that is a that's a very high deformation. <laughs> uh, so right now you're 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 displacing almost fourteen hundred inches. Yeah. Um, okay. Actually, let me. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll help you debug it in a second. But but for everyone else in the class, you know that's that's kind of all I had planned today. Um, I'll stick around for for you know for for a few more minutes to help people debug their their answers. But you know if you uh, you know if you got somewhere else to be, then um, then definitely you know um, go ahead and get to it. So thank you guys for tuning in today as usual. Um, you know hopefully this answers activity went a little bit smoother than our previous ones. Um, and so Thursday is going to be our midterm, and so I'll see you all for that. And so have a good day, good luck studying, and I'll see you on on Thursday. Is your load negative on your post? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I see that. Let me see the uh, weight of the sign. So the midterm will start at the normal class time, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let me look at the uh, wind point force. Okay. Let me look at the spatially varying uh, pressure. Okay. Inches. Oh. Huh. Um, can you scroll down on the uh, on the bottom right? Okay, never mind. I, I see the max. Um, hmm. Equivalent stress. Uh, huh. The 
get support at the bottom. Can you, uh, can I look at the material properties for the post and for the sign? Yeah, 